If you want to take your Bibles out and turn to Mark 12, 13 through 17, that's what we'll be reading today. We're talking this summer about things that we stress out about, things that take up our attention, our time, the things that really aren't really important, we just seem to think about them way too often. But really the small things that actually are not all that big in the grand scheme of things. And that did that work there, Will? Okay, all right. Oops. There we go. Let's say our Bible verse that we're trying to memorize here. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. And again, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew six thirty three. When we pursue the things of God, the things that we need, the things of this world and so forth, that they all come in their own time. Now, Mark twelve thirteen through 17. It says, Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch Him in His words. They came to Him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin. And he asked them, whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Now, at the beginning there, it mentions Pharisees and Herodians. Now, the people who this was originally written to, they would know right away who those people are. So, want to cover that here quick. Pharisees, as you may know, are highly religious people who are opposed to the corrupt and pagan Caesar, the emperor of Rome. So, Pharisees are the, the pious religious people. They follow all the rules and the laws that they're supposed to, and then some. And these are the people who went to the synagogue every day and fasted twice a week and gave a tenth of all they had. These were the religious people. And because Rome was pagan, it it was ruled by a pagan emperor who was morally depraved in every way. The stuff that some of these Caesars have done is legendary. They were fiercely opposed to being ruled by such terribly wicked people. And it's not hard to understand why. And then there's the Herodians. You'll notice the word Herodian has the word Herod in it. Herod. Herod the Great. The one who was king when Jesus was born and tried to have him killed. Well, he, was, he had his whole dynasty so a bunch of his kids became kings or in, in, uh, the rulers of all different parts of his territory. The Herodians were those who were loyal to Herod's dynasty, and they thought Rome was great. They thought Rome brought all of this prosperity and all these good things to our land, and so, hey, we, we should be grateful to have Rome rule us. Pagan or not, hey, Things are going well. My pocketbook is full. I'm happy. So, by all means, let's pay our taxes to Caesar. 
So you have two people who are coming to Jesus who really don't get along at all, but neither of them really like him. And so, okay, who is he going to make angry? Now, a little more background. The Jewish people were heavily taxed very heavily taxed. We think we pay a lot of taxes. They probably paid maybe 50% of their income to taxes. Not only did they have to pay tax collectors whatever the tax collectors demanded, reasonable or not, but even the religious authorities had their own taxes so that the temple could be run and so forth and all of those expenses paid for and then the local authorities not only were not only were taxes going to Rome but taxes had to go to you know the Herodian dynasty and why did they need money well because they had to build bigger palaces they had to build bigger fortresses have bigger armies and they needed bigger and better things to wear, and more impressive stuff to own. So they were just living lavish lifestyles while the people of Israel were barely getting by and then taxed 50% on top of that. Not only were people barely eating, but they had to pay rich people to get richer and sinners to sin more. That's kind of the way it was. All of, their, all of their money was going to people who were not godly, who were not going to use that money for anything good. They were using it to just sin all the more. So Jesus is kind of in this stuck place here. They're trying to trap him, it says. So if he says, yes, pay taxes to Caesar, he gets in trouble. If he says, no, it's not good to pay taxes to Caesar, he's in trouble too. If Jesus said, pay taxes, then he would be hated by the people. Suddenly his popularity would plummet and everybody would hate him. Because they'd be saying, okay, you're telling us that we need to pay taxes to these horrible people who are ruling us, who are godless and merciless, and they're going to do all of these bad things with it? You want us to give them money? Money that we could use to feed our kids? Or Jesus could, could have said, well, no, don't, don't pay taxes to Caesar because they're, you know, the government's bad and corrupt. But if he said that, then he would get in trouble with Rome. And then the authorities would be after him. They have Herodians right there, witnesses. He would have been arrested and tried for treason. So he's really got no way out, or so they think. They're, they, they, got a, they got a good trap here. Now, he says... Let me see a denarius. He says, let me see a denarius. A denarius was a day's wage for the average worker. So you, if you worked out in somebody's field, you would get paid a denarius for the day. That's what a denarius looks like. And the denarius had Caesar's portrait, and it was also propaganda, because on the coin, just like we have words on, on our coins, on their coin, it praised him as a god. Kind of like this money that you possess here is because Caesar is a divine being who has given you wealth. So you, it's difficult to read there on the, the coins, but on the left side where it has Caesar's face, it says, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. Kind of like saying, son of God. And then on the other side, there's a, a woman there who's seated. That's the Roman goddess of peace. 
And then it also says there, supreme ruler. So in other words, Tiberius Caesar is the son of God and the supreme ruler. And your money comes from him. And peace comes from him. So this very coin that you would get paid every day says this stuff on it. So it's interesting that Jesus says, so whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? And then verse 17, the key verse for today, I'm going to give you the, the uh, authoritative Aaron Vriesman translation. And this is without, without uh, smoothing things over in any way. The things of Caesar give to Caesar, and the things of God to God. If you translate it word for word without, without smoothing it out at all, that's exactly what it says. Those things of Caesar give to Caesar. And the things of God to God. And so what he's saying here is that there are certain things that are Caesar's. And he can have them. There are certain things of God. And you give God those things. Caesar's things are the things of the world. They're the things that most people chase after, fight each other over, you know. These are the things that cause hatred and envy. They make the headlines of the newspapers. This is what you read about in the news. And they ruin people's lives all the time. And we worry about these things way too much. So, money and property. There's respect and honor. There's winning and having bragging rights. You know, there's a whole sports section about, and it's about who, who won and who has the, the bragging rights. There's politics. There's a whole section on politics on every news website out there. It's all about who's in position and who has the power. I mean, right now we're starting starting all this news about the presidential election that's not going to happen for another year and a half. And it's already making most of the headlines right now. And then there's feeling good and just pleasures. So there's a guy drinking a Coke there. And uh, Coke's slogan, most recently anyways, is open happiness. Open happiness. This is what this is what we're exposed to every day of the week. This is what we are told is important. This is what we're told is what we need to have. And as I was just just myself, as I was singing, I'd rather have Jesus than than this and this and this and this and this. I was it sort of felt like I was resetting and unwinding all of, the, all of these messages that I had accumulated throughout the week. Because no matter whether you're just reading the news or, or driving down the road and seeing billboards, these are the kinds of things that, that you're going to get. And they, they get in here. So as I was just singing just that last song. I remember thinking, it was like all of that stuff got rewound. And it was like, okay, yeah, no, Jesus is the most important thing. God's things are spiritual and eternal. All of this stuff, that goes away. In fact, a lot of it doesn't even last in our lifetimes. You can only be a president, for example, for eight years. And 
Not everybody lives to see their retirements. There's certain people who lose their entire, entire uh, savings. And people don't stay winners for long either. But God's things are spiritual and they're eternal. And these are the things that are really worth going after. And they're not as difficult to get either. Well, maybe that could be debated, but still. Maybe the first thing on this list, people's hearts and minds. People's hearts and minds. That includes our own and includes others around us. What's most important to us? What will we drop everything to do? What are we thinking about most of the time? How, how do we put two and two together? What, what, what method do we use to make our decisions? Are we using God's wisdom or are we going after our own things? Our hearts and minds. Another thing, our acts of worship and prayer. Being here this morning, worshiping God in a chorus of believers, that, that's a spiritual thing that lasts for eternity. We're worshiping an eternal God. This is an investment in eternity, if you want to think of it that way. Your times when you're talking with God, that draws you nearer to God. That focuses you on what's really important, and it takes the stuff that you would normally worry about, get angry about, get all bent out of shape about, and it gives it to somebody, God, who can take care of it. Other things, forgiveness that doesn't let sin define relationships. That's really hard. But this is a thing of God. When Corey Ten Boom forgave one of the soldiers at her concentration camp, that was not a human thing. Only God can give that kind of forgiveness. And that's powerful. To give up that anger that hatred, that bitterness towards somebody who hurt you so terribly. Love that does what's best for others. Not what's easiest, not what's most convenient, not what comes to mind first, but doing the right thing for others. Whether it's easy or hard, whether it's politically correct or not, and sometimes even if they will hate you for it. Love that does what's best for others. Joy that endures through any circumstances. There's people who have been burned at the stake and they are singing praises to God. That's joy. And that can only come from God. And then there's peace that doesn't need to brag. It doesn't need to win. You can, you can, uh, you can compete hard and, and do your best. And if you lose, that's okay. That's okay because you have something better. When you finish the race and get the prize that's heavenly, none of these, you, you can... You can have all of the gold medals in history and all of that will just disappear. Patience that doesn't need to feel good before doing good. There's a whole section in one of my psychology books about how people will do good things for other people when they feel good. So if... They just had some good news, and they just had a good meal. People are more likely to, to help you out. 
if they've just got some bad news and they're hungry, not feeling the best, they're less likely to help you out. If you're patient, you don't need to feel good in order to do what's right, to help other people if they're in need. And faithfulness that sticks to God no matter what. Sticking with God no matter what. It doesn't matter what it's going to cost you. Maybe, maybe everything in this entire world is going to be taken away from you. That doesn't matter. You're still going to stick with God. That's something from heaven. And then gentleness that gives others respect and honor. There's a lot of people out there who want to demand respect and honor. They like to bully people. They like to push you around or intimidate you. Sometimes they try to pull rank so that they can get you to do something small so they can feel good about themselves. But if you give people like that respect and honor and you could care less about whether they're controlling you or not, That's gentleness. And when you do that, that kind of that kind of throws them off. Those people that crave that power and attention. The point here that Jesus is trying to make is that Caesar can have his stuff. Give him what what's his. He can have it. It's going to go away. It's temporary. It's not going to last. It's not worth your time. It's not worth your worry. It's not worth stress. It's not worth your heart or your life or anything. Yeah, you need money and food, shelter and clothing and things like that. But if you seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. Caesar can have his stuff. And even by giving to Caesar things that Caesar wants, we show that we have better things from God. When we give to Caesar the things that Caesar wants, then we are showing to ourselves, we're showing to anyone who notices that, you know what, there's better things. You can have my money. You, you, want, you want the, the winner's trophy? You can have it. If you want the corner office, you can have it. You want the better salary? Fine. If you give those things to the people who are obsessed with them, that says something. I have better things to focus on. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Dear God in heaven, thank you for all that you've given to us and done for us. We are richly blessed, but we pray, O oh Lord, that we would not be defined by these things. Lord, may you be the one who we look for, look to, and seek after, and all of the blessings that you give. In the name of Jesus, amen.